It's part two of our conversation with writer Peter Kearns. We interviewed him last year when he wrote On Track, Elton John, Every Album, Every Song, 1969-1979. This time around, we're talking to him about his new book, 10CC and Godly and Cream, Every Album, Every Song. What's the 10CC song when you were doing the research for the book that was the biggest surprise for you that maybe was your uncovered gem from the band that you, you kind of thought that the underrated song, I guess? Because um, everyone well, talks about the, the things you do for love or art for art's sake or, you know, all the, like a lot of those songs, rubber bullets. and There were two or three that I wasn't, I wasn't that enamored with back in the day that now I, I like. I mean, one in particular was uh, Baron Samedi. There's a song called Baron Samedi. And I guess I, when I was younger, I guess I just didn't get it. But coming back to it, it was really quiet, sort of a tongue-in-cheek, sort of Haitian kind of voodoo vibe, not a million miles away from, what's that, that Redbone at Witch Queen in New Orleans, seemed to take a sort of a cue from that, and it's kind of a fun song, but sort of serious at the same time, it's kind of talking about some kind of dark, kind of black magic stuff almost, yeah. and uh, that, that song kind of struck me. What I'm doing now is I'm going back, because people always bitch, oh, there's not enough good new music morning you don't have an even if you're 10 you don't have enough years left in your life even if you live till 110 to go back and get every piece of rock and roll that you have missed right yeah you know yeah yeah go back and and listen to it so you forced me to go back like i said yesterday i was listening to the first album which at the time i get i kind of thought it was cool because i was young and i loved doo music by the time I was 18 years old I, I thought the first album was complete rubbish I remember going I don't like it anymore I'm a rocker now but now I love it again even before you, you wrote the first book. album but there was always that tongue-in-cheek sort of feel I mean I think I think they're I think they're all I mean I think they're all light-hearted in what they were doing yeah. I don't think that they were they were I mean, I think they were serious about having a career, but I don't think that they were that they were overly serious or or you know even pretentious about the music in any way. I think it was just what what they came up with was a natural outpouring as an extension of their natural personalities. Yeah. It, it, it was fun. It had uh, like the early stuff. It was fun. It had. Um, and some aspects from some other music, you could sort of hear some of the sort of Zappa, sort of 60s Zappa kind of leanings in there, the sort of Mother's Invention thing from time to time, that sort of thing. And, of course, with the artwork, like the logo on the first album, you know, you know, with the big phallic symbol standing there proud. I mean, I, you know, it was years before I even noticed that, you know. You know, that, that, they, just, they just did stuff, and you either got it or you didn't. Some things went over, went over people's heads, I would imagine. I mean, like one example I use is the song on original soundtrack called The Film of My Love. Right. Which is, to, to me, I mean, I've never really seen anyone that sort of said what I said about it in, in this way, that I, I believe it was a complete dig, and not just at a certain style of music and that was on the charts at the time, kind of a, a kind of a lowbrow kind of, cheesy crowd pleaser type approach um, which was happening then but um, it also is to me is a definite kind of a, a poke of fun at songwriters that aren't quite there yet there was te- the techniques used in that song where they where they purposefully uh, made, made little rookie mistakes to reflect the kind of people that that did do that or would do that. And, uh, I mean, there's a lot of it in there. I mean, I could go into detail, but there's so many little tricks in there that are just things that, well, you know, well, I should fix that later, you know, but but they put them in on purpose. And it's a statement, you know, and I think some people get it and some people don't. I remember someone had written in uh, God, it was an old paper, uh, newspaper clipping, that it can, and it wasn't a surprise to anybody at the radio station when I, uh, I took it out of their filing system. That Ten CC too smart for their own good, too clever for their own good. That was the headline. Yeah. You know, because some yeah. people looked at them that way of going, are they highbrow? Are they do, are they in on the joke? Are they not? And do they care? There's a lot of these things that people talked about when I was in high school when they talked about Ten CC, and then I'm not in love came out, and people went, huh? What? What the? Well. Are they are they screwing with us still? I mean, 
We had these yeah. thoughts of yeah. this band. Yeah, I, I, well, I guess I'm not in love. Was I mean they, they would do they would do anything. I mean I think it just so happened when they did that song, the focus didn't happen to be on you know let's make a fun lyric or or put a gag in here or anything. You know, I don't. Th- also, I don't think they were thinking well, let's not do that. It just didn't happen to happen there, and the and the focus was on uh, um, uh, achieving what they were trying to achieve with the chorale or the vocal thing. You know, so that that that. That seemed to be the, the focus here. They had the song. Of course, they tried it in a different style at first, like a bossa nova. Yeah. But so they had a good song sitting there, and they didn't. They probably didn't have to even worry about that kind of thing. Like, how is this going to be received? You know, they were probably aware it was a fairly straight song, but I don't. I, I doubt that. Again, I just think right through that period, right up to where they the four of them broke up, I don't believe that they ever considered. Too much. I think they just, it was just this art that they were doing. And it came out one way or it came out another. And whatever way that was, was the way it was. And I really don't think that they, that they tried to bend it towards the will of a record company or anyone else. And until it sort of got to a certain point, perhaps the things we do for love or that sort of period was they're starting to think, well, you know, maybe we should put a couple of those in, you know. I really, but up until there, I really, I just think it was just a natural, they were just musicians doing music and they weren't messing with it. It was just flowing yeah. out of yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, yeah, as far as being conscious of writing hit, hit singles, I remember used to, people used to say this about in radio when we were looking back at Todd Rundgren's early career of going, here's a guy who could write a lot of hits mm-hmm. if he wanted to. But he just, he's, whatever comes out, comes out with him. He's not strategic like that or refuses but he did, to be. He did hits too. Didn't he? Well, he did. He did. But yeah. but Todd Rundgren, to me, just like 10CC, looking back at that catalog, I keep going, mm. well, they could have done, they just didn't, they just did whatever, like you just said, whatever came out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well I think, yeah, I know, we need to keep on subject, I guess. But I mean, Todd, Todd wasn't too scared to show his influences either. Because he would, you know, there was a, there was a lot of, I mean, there was always the Carol King, there was always the Laura Nairo, you know, in there. Listen, I mean, especially now, I can hear it more. If I go back and listen to, you know, something, anything, for example, this, I can hear Carol King on half of that stuff, you know. Well, speaking of that, yeah. Neil, you you had written that Neil Sedaka had uh, given them some encouragement, right, to be a, a band. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, because because they worked on those two albums of his, mm-hmm. and and he had, yeah, it's it my understanding that he had actually backed up what they were doing and said, yeah, well, you should really, you should really do records in your own right, you know. I mean, they'd already done Hot Legs, obviously. Um, and I think they were working on the first album at the time. I'm trying to remember the timeline, but um, yeah, it was a. His was part of the the impetus behind just sort of putting their foot down and getting it done. With his encouragement. Yeah. yeah. What about the Godly and Creme years? That I remember when I first started seeing their videos of going, yeah, that's them, all right. Because I had mm. a preconceived idea of, well, well, a their their talent sprouted in so many different areas once they got out on their own. What was your impression mm. of them as a, a duo and a, an artistic couple? Uh, well, I, I loved it. I mean, when I came, as I said earlier, when I came to the Ten CC thing as a teenager, um, which was in the mid eighties. I uh, I then by extension went and listened to the Godly and some of the Godly and Cream stuff, and I, at the time I was more interested in that because I thought this is you know, this is interesting this is this is more experimental you know I don't want to use the word wacky really but you know it was whatever the, the serious word for wacky would be. It's a little wacky. <laughs> it's a little wacky. <laughs> a lot of it was wacky, yeah. But um, yeah, I loved all that stuff, especially the freeze frame album, which again, uh, like Ten CC, would have it would have gags and it would have sort of humorous moments and things. But all the way along, uh, in conjunction with that, was a, a light-hearted seriousness. If I can use that term, a seriousness about your art, but they didn't take themselves seriously. And so, the, and the, the minds are completely open. Just, they were just doing what they're doing, trying every idea. Anything that worked stayed, and it didn't matter whether it was, you know, appeared to be sort of a, 
alien 1821. I mean, there's nothing negative. You know, they were just doing, I mean, it sounds pretentious, this term, but they were just doing pure art, I think. Yeah. You know, and they'd get the art would come out and worry about it later, you know. And, and that's the way to do it, I think. You know? If someone comes up to you and say, what do you do for a living, Peter? And you'd go... I write books, and I was in the music industry, and you know, I. Uh, yeah. uh, but I've got this. I uh, got this. What's your latest one? Oh, it's a book on ten cc. How would you describe? Someone said, "What? Well, well, what, what's the deal? Why should I read this book?" Uh, how would you? I, and I couldn't even come up with a. I don't think I could describe ten cc. But how would you describe them as? Well, if someone asked me that question. I'd say, well, it's. You know, it depends on your taste in music. If you, I mean, they kind of cover a lot of gamuts. I mean. Yeah. For example, like here in New Zealand, there's a, there's a big following for blues. There's a lot of sort of blues rock bands in this country. So I would certainly say, well, there's definitely, an, for example, if you're interested in blues rock, there's an element of that, 10 CC, like Eric Stewart. It's, it's a lot of his songs came from a background of the blues. I, th- I would say, you know, I think that there are, there are certain songs that are definitely in a mode, or definitely in that mode, but then there are, obviously there are a lot of the other tracks that cover, that are eclectic, simultaneously they cover a lot of ground you know at the same time you know, your heavy blues thing some of it will be simultaneous some of it will just change from section to section you know there's a blues chorus and then there's suddenly it's a waltz the verse is a waltz you know then you've got a rock guitar solo then you've got a, a sort of adult guard synthesizer thing that comes in with a with a joke over it and then bam it's back to the rock again and it just moves all the time so if you like if you like something that's consistently kind of changing keeps itself rooted in enough in, in what it is to keep your attention then 10cc is for you did you tackle this one bite at a time one album at a time how did you start the project what was it like did you start at the beginning uh, but with the albums I did I, li- I listened to them in, in order yeah wrote about them in order well at least made my notes in order yeah. You know, you'd get to a certain point, listen, a certain time period. You know, if, I, if I'd if i started in the middle or something and moved around, then I'd, I would lose the timeline of certain things happening that were important to the information, like, you know, certain kinds of uh, songwriting changes or gear, uh, you know, equipment or gear changes that would suddenly, you know, new, new elements in the music, that kind of thing. If I listened to it chronologically, then I could catch everything as it as it sort of occurred, yeah. as opposed to you know, oh that's interesting what they've done 1978. Maybe I should sort of go into that a bit, and then suddenly go back to 1973 and realise what well, they actually did it all back then. So I did have to chronologise it in that way. Yeah, as far as listening to it. What did you find when you were writing the? I mean, obviously, it's fine tooth comb stuff. You know, when you're doing your books. Mm. What was yeah. it like with the Johnny Mitchell stuff? It was exactly like you say. I mean, I, I was. There was a, there's a lot of information out there. I mean, JoniMitchell.com alone has a, a, just a raft of stuff. But I was constantly, I, I was constantly amazed by her eloquence. You know, like you say, not not just in, in her lyrics, obviously, but in just in interviews and things. Just the way she would she would word things, and she would she would just peel off these. Perfect lines, yeah. you know, even with alliteration and everything. It's constant sort of intellectual stuff, really. Yeah. You know, she's just a, a brain box. Well, she would know? write, someone had once told me that we were talking about people who write pretty, like write, they write it the first time and it stays that way. Right. And I remember a, John had told me, he says, you know, Joni writes pretty. She, uh, it's beautiful, not always the first time, obviously. She's human like everybody else, but she's capable of doing that. That line's not going right. to change, right? Well, I think she did both things. Yeah. Uh, well, I know, I know she did both things. I mean, there were, there was, there were some, there are examples in the book. There's at least one example of, of one lyric that went through major, uh, major changes from, from beginning to end to the point where at the end of it, it was virtually unrecognisable from the beginning. So, yeah, I think she, she did both things. Like she, some things she would, I mean, as you, like you call it writing pretty, I mean, a lot of that she did earlier. And I, th- and I think that she, she came to a point in her career where she didn't, she kind of looked back on her first sort of four albums as kind of, you know, sort of juvenilia, if you like, you know, like, including both sides now, which which to me is like, stands up today as just a fantastically concise piece of work. But she, you know, by 1980, she was kind of laughing at it a bit, you know, and thinking, oh, yeah, it's a, it, it's a, bit, it's a bit juvenile, but it was actually extremely mature for a 23-year-old to be writing. So the point being that, yeah, I think she would write a lot of the early things she would write, but kind of 
I don't think it would get changed too much. But then as time moved on, she sort of work more work more on them and what can I do here? And especially, you know, and you get into the hissing of summer lawns and all that stuff. It's just, a, you know, a poetry of language, kind of a word play and, I mean, you have to read the book. It's quite, it's quite, quite a detailed book. With uh, when she got into jazz, I remember I dropped her, and then by the time I started listening to her '80s stuff, I loved her '80s stuff, which made me go back to the early stuff, which made me go back to the jazzy stuff. That's the order that right. was in for me. That then she had me right. like I made a like playlist for, and it includes everything to me because it's just Joni Mitchell now, right? As opposed to before the genres of Joni Mitchell. Yeah, well, I guess by the time of, I mean, the, my introduction to her really as an as an album was Dog Eat Dog of all things, mm-hmm. and at, when it came out, and I absolutely loved it. But but I think by the time she gets to that stage, you've got you've got elements of it all in there. I mean, this the kind of the kind of folkiness is still in there, even though she never considered herself a folk singer per se. But there's the jazz harmony is in, is all in there. You've got your rock, you know, some of the songs have got the, the heavy guitar in them. And she just kind of congealed it all down to a just kind of a Joni Mitchell kind of soup by then. Yeah, like, so like you say, like with Larry Klein, was, he was really great, I think, at including the fretless bass in some of the later material. You know, keeping it tame, he, didn't want to, he wasn't trying to compete with what Jaco did or anything, yeah. you know, as if anyone could. But he still did it, you know, and so, so that, that kept... Anyone that was a fan of that era, the Jaco era of her, was still being, they were still hearing that tone, and so that was keeping me in there, but it was all in there by then. It was fascinating music. I just interviewed Brian Bromberg, and he had just released, he re-released his, his Hendrix, uh, Bromberg does Hendrix, and, and we got onto Jaco, and, and uh, like I swear mm-hmm. to God, he could have gone, and Brian's just like a world class, one of the best as well, as far as bass players. And he, he's using a piccolo bass, so it sounds like a guitar yes. on the. And it's just insane. It's just, I've, you've never heard it. I mean, it's just well worth a listen. And he's not, he's not doing it like Hendrix did. He does all the Hendrix songs, but he does them as Brian Bromberg channeling Hendrix. But it's, it, it has that sound, of course. Right. But when he talked about Jocko, it was just like, I swear to God, I thought he was going to cry. He was just so, he knew him. It was, you know, the most mm-hmm. tragic story. I want to thank Peter Kearns for hanging out with us. I love talking to Peter, and he's an exceptional writer. There'll be links in the description of this video where you can pick up his books. There's a Joni Mitchell book coming around in just a few weeks. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. And please, buy a t-shirt. Help support the channel. We have t-shirts for Rock History Music, Rock History Book, and Rock History Canada. I'm John Bowden. Take care of yourself.